What happens when we come to a place in our lives where we've begun to expect God to show up in a certain particular way? When we've become so accustomed to the rushing wind or the still small voice that we expect him to only come in that way. This is where we've come to. I believe in the broad spectrum of the church, we've put God in a box of what and how we think he should and could move. A place where we worship worship more than praising the one to be worshiped. Instead of wanting his fullness, we'd rather have our preference. But the time for cardboard boxes to house his halfway presence has ended. And as I said last week, we're building a tabernacle for him to dwell in. So in 1 Kings chapter 17, which I'm going to read in a minute, we find Elijah and his encounter with the widow in Zarephath. The Lord came to him in the beginning of the chapter, telling Elijah to go and hide by the brook Cherith that flows into the Jordan, and that this would be the place he would be sustained during the drought. Elijah would drink from the brook, and ravens would be sent by God to feed him bread and meat morning and evening. And after a time, the brook dried up, and the Lord sent Elijah to Zarephath, where he, was command he had commanded a widow to provide for him. So I'm going to pause right there, and I'm going to read that. Um, <laughs> while we're maneuvering the little zoom boxes around so we can see the screen. I think that'll be good. Yeah. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the, into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. Thank you. I love pronunciation people in here. And dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little jar, a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So, as I was saying, all of this came to pass, and when he came to the city gates, a widow was found there gathering sticks. And Elijah asked her for a drink of water and then asked her for bread. And the widow responded to his request with, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little jar of oil. And see, I'm gathering a couple sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son and that we may eat it and die. And I want to pause right there. And I just want to talk um, real quick about the fact that she was gathering sticks. And I think, um, a lot of times in our lives too, we feel like there's little minuscule tasks and things that we're doing that God has us on like almost like rabbit trails with our lives. Or when we're talking with somebody and all of a sudden we go one direction completely opposite of where we had originally intended. And it feels like we may be gathering sticks, but this widow was out gathering sticks for a purpose. They were, they may have been seemed as small, minuscule little tasks to do, but she was gathering for the purpose of being able to make the bread cakes that would feed and nourish her, her son, and Elijah. So there's my little rabbit trail. 
And then Elijah told her not to fear, to do as she said she would, and then proclaim that the bin of flour shall not be used up, and neither should the jar of oil run dry until the Lord sent rain to the earth again. So what I wanted to highlight from this story is how both the widow's perspective and Elijah's, God moved in an unexpected way. He provided from his fullness, not their preference. Because I think if we all, in our fleshly human ways, if Elijah had had it from his preference during the drought, he would have been set up in a castle probably with the king feeding him grapes. But instead, the Lord took him to the wilderness. So... He provided from his fullness, not their preference. He used their lack or deficiency to show his sufficiency, his splendor and his abundance as father and provider. And when it comes to ministry, and we all do some form of ministry, as we talked about last week, we have to do a few things. The first is we have to be authentic. We have to be honest about our deficiencies. Although in the story of Elijah and the widow, their lack was more in the realm of food to survive. We can take this and apply it to our daily walk with the Lord. Are we deficient in quality time with him, lacking in faith or in self-control or even lacking in love at times? It's hard to be open and honest with ourselves and the Lord sometimes, but just like when the widow was honest about her lack, when she was honest and said, I don't have this. All I have is a little bit of flour and oil and I'm gathering sticks so me and my son can eat and then die. She was honest about her lack. And if we too are honest, there could be a miracle waiting in the wings because sometimes authenticity is what a miracle is hinged upon. The second thing he told her was not to fear. Not only did Elijah tell the widow not to fear, but we're told over 300 times in scripture not to fear in several different ways. The widow feared death and Elijah, I'm sure, had many of his own fears going through his head at the time of the story. They both had to step past their fears and their deficiencies in order for God to accomplish what was meant to be done in this portion of their stories. One thing we all know is that if the enemy cannot stop you, he will try to get you to stop yourself. The enemy will try to paralyze you with fear. So what would have happened if Elijah had allowed fear to paralyze him in this stage of his journey? What if the widow had halted herself from helping Elijah in fears of her own family's needs and impending death? Fear is yet another thing that can stall a miracle from coming forth. And the third thing we see in scriptures is to simply go. And this word can be broken down in every language, concordance, translation, and it will still have the same meaning at its root. And that is to move, to keep going forward. And there can be no growth or development or increase without moving. At some point, we have to put feet to our faith. When God gives us an assignment, we're meant to carry it out. And I want to share a story of mine that's an example of this from my walk with the Lord. About four years ago, I was at a conference with a friend, and it was a women's gathering there to uplift each other in our faith, to worship together and pray together. And I just made a pivotal move in my walk with the Lord concerning obedience and yielding to him. And somehow I'd ended up at this conference feeling way over my head and surrounded by women I felt were twice as far in their walks as I was. But as this one lady got up to speak and began to write and write so much that I didn't register a word coming from her lips. And at the end of her talk, she took her seat right in front of me. And I knew sitting in my lap in a random notebook was something that the Lord from the Lord that she needed to hear. But I was scared that I had misheard or that it wasn't really for her or that I'm only, I guess I was 19 at the time. I was only 19 years old. And there was a woman probably twice my age in front of me with twice the experience with the Lord. And here I am small and just, I was, I was afraid that I wasn't hearing his voice. And so I did what we've talked about so far. I acknowledge that where I lack, he fills where I fear he gives courage. And when I cannot see, I still obey his go. So I timidly tapped her on the shoulder and began to read what I felt the Lord had to say to her. And I was filled with joy as I got to watch her jump for joy, cry out in thanks to the Lord and hug her sister sitting beside her for the confirmation that was just delivered through a complete stranger. And the reason I share this story was not just to point out these things, though, authenticity, do not fear and go. But it was to show that when God gives us something, whether it be a word, a miracle, a gift or anything, the glory belongs to one and it's not us. 
We talked last week about gifting versus anointing, how when we have people who would rather be paraded than crushed, we will still see people bound and shackled. I know you must be thinking, how does all this relate to the fivefold ministry? Well, think about it. If Elijah would have rather been paraded as a titled prophet than crushed and used by Elohim for his purposes and his glory, what would have happened? What if when the miracle of the widow and her oil not running dry and her flour not running out, what if when that had been accomplished, what if Elijah had instead claimed the glory of it? What if instead of getting hidden and trusting upon the Lord to provide and supply, Elijah would have rather carried a title on his Facebook page? Like I said, God wants crushed people, not gifted ones. And I just wanted to show a couple pictures too. Sometimes God asks us to do things that don't make sense. I mean, he told Elijah, go by this, by this brook. I'm going to send ravens to feed you twice a day. You're going to drink from here. And then when it runs dry, I'm going to send you to the city gates where a widow is going to be commanded to, to take care of you. And it, it's things that don't make sense to us a lot of times in our human mindset. And that's because we can't necessarily see the distance that he can see. And then I thought this was a good picture as well, because the widow gave the gift of everything. So throughout scripture, we're told of what hum, um, we're told about humility. It's one of the higher callings on our lives, I believe. Proverbs 29, 23 says, a man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. James 4, 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Luke 1, 52 says, he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has exalted the humble. And Luke 14, 11 says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So we can see just from these few verses, how important humility is to our walk and our journey. Now I relate this to the story of Elijah and the widow because of the what ifs that could have played out in this particular story. What if, like I had said, Elijah would have rather been paraded than crushed or hidden? What if he wanted the glory for himself instead of humility? Or what if the widow had chosen not to help Elijah? This entire story hinges on obedience, on acknowledging that we don't have enough in us to bring forth results on our own and putting feet to our faith, the action of our belief. And another instance that's not about Elijah and the widow, when the Israelites were brought to the Red Sea and it was parted, what if they had stood there and said, oh, this must be for those other children of God. We can't cross that. It's, you know, what if they had chosen not to out of fear or out of disobedience even? Look at all the what ifs that one act of putting feet to your faith causes to happen. Yes. Stepping forward, putting that foot forward, feet to your faith, the action of obedience causes. And I wanted to share this whole story to show a glimpse of the fivefold ministry position of the prophet. Elijah was a great prophet. And in this story, we see obedience, humility, and many other qualities of someone submitted to the will of the father. There's a special title that a prophet takes on, though, and it's the heart revealer. They not only reveal the heart of God for his people, like we see Elijah doing in his actions of 1 Kings 17, God the provider, God the healer, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, but they also work hand in hand with the words of knowledge and discernment to reveal the heart of man. An example of this can be seen in 1 Samuel 9, 19, when the prophet Samuel found Saul, who was chosen to be king of Israel. And he said, Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. They are our heart revealer. This is just one aspect of the prophet, though. They're instrumental in helping people to hear the heart of God. And it's often for the first time. And then helping them show how they, too, can hear his voice as a birthright of their salvation. But one way I'm going to show you that you can remember a prophet right now, and I'm going to add to this every single day um, that we come back and talk about the fivefold ministry, is each part of the fivefold ministry fits onto your hand. You can remember them by your fingers, and the prophet will be your pointer finger. And it's because they point the way. They also point the sin. <laughs> that too. <laughs> 
<laughs> Julie said they also point to sin, which I completely agree with. Um, and I was just about to mention that part. Um, prophets are character characteristically known for pointing the way forward, for providing direction, and for being the voice of God for the people. And the the voice forward can also come as warnings to the people about their widespread sin and drifting from his ways, which can be seen by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 19, when he prophesies the judgment to come upon the people and symbolically breaks the clay jar. Now, I'm not going to read that entire passage because it was a very long one, but um, it's just another point to show how the prophet is this conduit for revealing the heart of God to the people and also revealing the heart of man. And prophets are also seen throughout scripture and history as the ones who cannot simply stand by and allow events of injustice to happen. They're compelled to help the needy, broken and oppressed. And one account of this is in Dan Ch Daniel chapter 3, verses 8 through, th through 30, when the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego unfolds. So I'm going to actually read that right now, if y'all would like to turn there with me. Um, yeah, I just didn't have enough space on the screen to put it there. <laughs> All right. Verses 8 through 30. Y'all still flipping? <laughs> All right. And I'm also going to butcher some of these words. I'm just realizing that. <laughs> Therefore, at the time certain Chale Chaldeans. Chaldeans, thank you, came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery mm -hmm. and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace there are certain jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of babylon shadrach meshach and abednego these men o king have not paid due regard to you they do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery and symphony with all kinds of music and you fall down and worship the image which i have made good but if you do not worship you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace and who is the god who will deliver you from my hands shadrach meshach and abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery fur furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the fiery, burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three bound men, three men bound, into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps administer, satraps, thank you, administers, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men whose bodies in the fire, whose, on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So, their choice to obey only God, to not bow down to the gods of men, but to fear Elohim, set the stage for our faith to grow by seeing their decision to trust and obey God, even if it meant not being the popular ones. I think they set an example for our own lives in this time we're walking into. Will we be obedient enough to not bow down to the gods of men, to not bow down to the vaccine, to the LGBTQ plus agenda, to the communist freedom stealers, to choose instead to stand, even if it means we're the lone ranger in a sea of others bowing down. Think about all these stories and dozens more, which, and dozens more we know, each of us, throughout scripture about the prophets, the things they helped usher in, the warnings they gave, the blessings they brought, the direction they gave, they pointed the way, challenged injustice, and revealed the heart of God and man. They helped people to hear the voice of God. They put feet to their faith, acknowledged they couldn't accomplish the things that they did in their own strength, and they went when the Father said, go. Now imagine what these accounts would have looked like if we didn't have prophets. Where would we be lacking in scripture and in today's time? We would see people lack in hearing the voice of God, which creates a distance between a father and his children, a lack of relationship, which ultimately would lead to the temple of our bodies not being properly built or built at all. There'd be a lack of intimacy with God. Again, no relationship would be present because without prophets, there wouldn't be someone present to reveal the heart of God and teach others how to hear his voice. And we'd also see people beginning to attribute the works of Satan for the works of God. And this would come from a lack of discernment in the body. Think of how we see the Kundalini spirit presenting itself in the church today as a false Holy Spirit. It counterfeits everything that God beautifully crafted, but when it boils down to it, it's still a counterfeit, a fake. And how would we know that without discernment, without the prophet to help point the way to the Father and to reveal his heart? So I'm going to read the, um, the verse out of Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. And I think the little Zoom thing cuts off just at the last line. Yeah, I think it cuts off just at it. Bingo. That's it. That's, That's it. it. That's okay. Yeah. In Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16, we're told the of the fivefold ministry, which says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. 
And I want to pause right there and talk about um, this last part that was saying, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. And something that I've learned and even shared with my other people um, in the past several years is about how when God gives you a gift, an assignment, a talent, or whatever it may be, that's for his glory and his purposes, just like if the Lord has put you in the position of a prophet or someone who operates in prophecy, the hand is the hand, the mouth is the mouth. The body has each part and each joint working together to make the body up. So if um, God has made you the mouth, then don't try to be the hand. If God has made you the hand, don't try to be the mouth. He puts you where you fit to make the body whole, to make it where every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. Without profits, the fivefold is incomplete. When any part of the fivefold ministry is missing, ignored, or dismissed, we have an incomplete version of the original design. So now we're going to um, listen to a worship song now. And I want us to, after that, we're going to take some time and begin to pray um, about prophets to rise in this group. We're going to pray about the gift of prophecy to be manifested in full. And um, a lot of times, too, prophecy does not necessarily mean predicting the future or predicting, oh, Donald Trump's going to be president. That's not what prophecy means. It can mean pointing the way revealing the heart of God, revealing the heart of man. It can be discernment, words of knowledge, exhortation, or encouragement. So after we worship for a bit, we are going to practice the gift of prophecy because I believe just as much as important as it is to read and get discernment from the Lord about what the fivefold ministry is, it's just as important to practice hearing his voice. And so that's what we're going to do after we worship. Hey, let me, before you. Sarah, can I ask you a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably should know this, but I've heard you use that term, kundalini yes. spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely, you yes. It's a false word, Holy Spirit, so, counterfeit. So the counterfeit. kundalini spirit is, um, it's widely kind of known, I believe, in Hinduism or Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay, it's Hinduism, and um, it can be found even in like yoga classes and stuff oh, like that. Okay. They're talking about your chakras, the third eye. It's very new age, mm -hmm. and okay. the way I've always learned to identify Kundalini spirit in the church is it comes presenting itself as a false Holy Spirit, but our God, our King, is a gentleman. Is a gentleman. You know, He's not going to come in and make you rattle on the floor like a snake. Or, or bark like a dog, or bark like a dog, or or like he, the Holy Spirit is not going to cause you to do things like that. Our our King is a gentleman. He's he's a bridegroom who comes along and wraps his arms around us. And a Kundalini spirit is is a perverse counterfeit, counterfeit yeah. of the how, Holy Spirit. How do you spell that? Um, I spelled it K U N D A L I N I. K U N D A L I N I. It's a counterfeit. Yes, it's a counterfeit also, Holy Spirit. The yoga comes from the spine, the base of the spine. Yeah, I've, I watched a very interesting teaching one time from somebody about the Kundalini spirit and how they went on this whole self discovery thing um, through yoga and Hinduism and trying to awaken their um, like chakras and their third eye or something. And as she went through this journey, um, she became very demon filled and everything. And she had the Kundalini spirit. And when she, the closer and closer she got to opening all of her chakras up, the sicker and sicker she got. Sure. And wow. when she finally um, realized like, Hey, I'm, I'm Something's literally on my deathbed. Something's really wrong here. She, um, she went through some type of deliverance ministry and renounced all this stuff and pretty much reversed the curse. And she, she made a whole YouTube video. I'll have to see if I can find it. But um, she made this whole video about how 
dangerous it is to get involved with things like yoga. And while a lot of our modern Western culture thinks, oh, yoga is just stretching out your muscles and all this other stuff. The poses, yes, the, the poses that you're doing are um, attributing to Hindu gods. And so you're opening a door. So she wanted she my mom actually has a testimony yeah, about yoga and everything. Um, so so I used to get really bad cramps in my legs and I went to the firm, which is all women's um, yeah. place and they had yoga there and as i started going to it you know mostly just stretching to me at the time i actually started feeling better because you know the taylor can tell you had chronic cramping going on it was left. bad it, yeah it was really bad emergency room bad so i knew i needed something but anyway so and i loved it and then um i decided to take it a step further and go to one at the old mill and this particular place was more in tune to the meditation side of it. And I had never been in this, in this, at the firm, it was really, and truly, I felt like it was just a stretching class, you know, but when I went to this one, I decided to take my park, my mat beside the window. And I happened to notice the, the um, Hindu gods in the window it had the elephant and mm -hmm. one other one. Ganesh. And, and I looked Ganesh. at them. And I looked at him and I said, you can't even talk. <laughs> and I did my practice and left. When I got home that night, I got tremendously dizzy and just felt really sick. And I told Taylor and my husband, I said, I'm going to bed. I don't feel good. And I went and laid down and they were in the living room watching TV. The minute I fell asleep, I had a horrible nightmare. I mean, I, I dreamed that they were being murdered in the living room and I woke up and I was like, Whoa, that was a bad dream. And I brushed it off and I went back to sleep again. Fell, and this was, you know, early in the day, I fell back asleep again, woke up again to the same thing. They were being murdered. And I said, Johnny Taylor, are y'all okay in there? And they're like, yeah, we're fine. And I went, <laughs> this is a spiritual attack. And I immediately went in my drawer beside my nightstand and got my anointing oil, I anointed my hair and I repented of it and told it to leave and immediately it stopped. So I was definitely attacked and I know it was from that. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I went back to the firm to the lady there and I said, she goes, um, are you coming in here today? And I said, I can't, I said, I can't come back. I told her, I said, I, I just had something happen and I just got to check in my spirit about this. And she goes, you, you got to go with your gut. And then I wonder, you know, about these teachers that continue to teach this. Do they not we, ever get that check? Encounter, our group was, was asked, we were allowed to go to a place with someone who actually had someone teach yoga there. And in that building. Some, that we in the use. building. And some of the people that have been under demonic, you know, attack mm -hmm. um, were having all kinds of attacks from being in the building. Mm -hmm. In the so, old mill? No, no. Was that the number one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we stopped going there. Mm -hmm. Wow. So honestly, I feel like stretching is good, but maybe yeah. just stretch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just stretch. yeah. Hey, before we leave this, this slide, um, something I've, I've heard a, a long time ago that, you know, in Greek, there's no punctuation. And like this comma that's right here, it says, you know, gave so you got apostles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers comma he gave some to be those and then another thing comma for for the equipping of the saints of the work of the ministry comma for the edifying. that comma really isn't there it is don't let that comma change the meaning of this see these apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers are for the equipping of the saints of the mm -hmm. work of ministry that's right so that's you know just kind of remove that comma there and that's perfect what you're you know going to this you know we're talking about this fivefold ministry that uh it's all collectively together for the equipping of the saints in other words those that for the equipping of the saints it's not a sixth category of people that oh well you're to be equipping the the, the saints for work right. of ministry. I'm just a pastor. I'm just a teacher. I'm not mm -hmm. supposed to be equipping the saints. You know, it's it's these five or four that. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to add before we go into this next slide and into, into this little time of worship that we're going to have, uh, I just want to add too that while we're doing this, I mean, I researched and researched all week long trying to figure out and almost like an angle to come at to talk about the gift of prophecy and the fivefold ministry. And I literally did not hear anything from the Lord until Thursday night this week about it. And so I'm learning this and learning new things just as much as the rest of us are. So if we, anybody decides to go home and do their own research and find something that's good to bring to the group about this or something about one of the fivefold part of the fivefold ministry, please do it because this is something that we all want to see manifested in this group. And so how are we going to do that without praying, seeking the Lord, knowing what it's all about mm -hmm. and obedience mm -hmm. and practicing it too. I mean, how are we, mm -hmm. how are we going to know how can the gift of prophecy be manifested if all we do is talk about it? <laughs> wow, good. So, uh, can I share this real quickly? I looked up yes, the Kundalini uh, spirit, the definition here. Mm -hmm. This is Siri knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't use, I don't even use Siri. Jan anyway, said this is Siri on, knowledge about says, Kundalini spirit. In Hinduism, Kundalini Sanskrit, Kundalini pronunciation. No, nope, okay. Coiled snake. Yeah, yeah is a form of divine feminine energy mm -hmm. or shakti or what? believed to be s-h-a-k-t-i yes. -S believed to be located at the base of the spine mm -hmm. no, thank you. in the here. and then it goes on to say more mm -hmm. it's here huh it's at the bottom your tailbone oh yeah the base of the spine <laughs> okay. yeah interesting and then it goes on to give a lot more information about it mm -hmm. i wondered about the snake on the pole you know that's kind of it could be something that, <laughs> i mean i know it that was something <laughs> different he was <laughs> yeah. Chasing rabbit now yep yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rabbit yeah. all right can i give my theory about the snake on the pole sure sure we'll chase that Sorry, right. <laughs> nobody say no <laughs> no we said sure um the snake on the pole you know that's also the medical symbol mm -hmm. what i see is when they went and when they were in the wilderness and they and moses had gone up to the mountaintop and they thought oh surely god has killed them and they started worshiping the only way they really felt comfortable worshiping after all yah has let us down right so they went back to the way the egyptians worshiped when moses came off the mountain and he saw what they had done and how evil they had just turned back so quickly he said is this what you want then look at this and you'll live in a way now i know this it might be stretching it for some of y'all and for me too he says that jesus healed us by his stripes who were healed healing was such a magnificent huge part of new testament it was even in the old testament to take it away and say it doesn't exist anymore what's left heaven what about earth right. so i say to people who believe in the system look at the snake on the pole wow. but if you have a god somewhere else go to him Whoa, uh, good, Carolyn. it's uh it's a strong word but then on the other side i've and i god forgive me if i'm wrong here when joseph was told to take the mother and the baby and flee to egypt i'm sure he went to a jewish population in egypt but nevertheless egypt is a type of the world and so i felt like there may be times when we go into the world for safety security provision health there may be a time you go to a bank there may be a time you you know what i'm saying there may be a time when you use the world systems but overall god wants us depending on him instead of the world systems because where is the enemy it's not the nurse it's not the teacher it's not the doctor um, the systems of these worlds are owned by run by the highest powers of darkness yep and so it's better if we don't live in those systems and give our thanks and our tithes and our blood to these systems instead i mean that's a deep word you think about it you go into a hospital you give blood you pay your tithes 
And what do they do with that blood and that medical waste? They burn it. I just see it as a type of, of the old life and there's a better life. But there are times we go to Egypt, but you better ask God. Hard word. Hard word. You'll be glad to save other people's lives, are you? You're not talking about that kind of. Steve said you weren't you weren't talking about blood donation, were you? No, 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 no. I'm talking about <laughs> listen, what I said are just thoughts that have that I have for much of my life lived by. But that doesn't mean that I'm right. It doesn't mean that God thinks like me, because that's not what the word says. <laughs> But what I am saying, it's something to consider. Everybody, I mean, I knew a gal who worked in the medical system and, and she went to get a hemorrhoid removed. I mean, how big of a deal is that? She ended up wearing a poopy bag. Oh, boy. Here's the thing. Did you ask God? Everything we do, asking God, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. So there's my lecture. Y'all don't hang me. <laughs> um, and and if you're going to the doctor and taking medicine, do what you want to do or what you think God's telling you to do. It's just food for thought because there will be a day and time to survive as a Christian. You will have to come out of the world systems. Oh yeah, yeah that's right. Mm -hmm. We know that. Yep. And you talk about practicing. Whew, we need to be practicing how to believe God to get rid of a headache before we. You know, yeah. have something huge put on us. Yeah, exactly. Take a big glass of water. First thing you do. <laughs> Serious. I thought that was for hiccups. <laughs> you don't have enough water in your body. Wow. That is very true. Absolutely. All right. So now we're going to go into a time of worship, and then I'm going to explain the activity that we're going to do. And I'm hoping it won't take too long. There's like 14 people that I've counted here. So. Anyways, Doodle -doo. bingo. Thirteen. All right. How do I mute? Mute. Yeah. Oh, mute yeah. ourselves. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Where's the zoom? Little oh, guy? we can mute right here. Oh. 
Stop sharing. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. That was a salt lamp. A salt. Himalayan salt lamp she loved there at the last. Okay. I had one in my bedroom. Stop sharing. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording. Mm hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm.